So, as uh, the people who know me, I'm very interested in, in AAV vectors since many, many years. And uh, since I arrived in Nantes, um, the new focus of my research was to better understanding the AAV when they are produced in insect cells, and you will understand why we work with AAV in insect cells um, uh, in a minute. So in this audience, you know a lot of AAV, but AAV are very interesting vectors because they are non-pathogenic, uh, even the wall type is not pathogenic, which is very interesting for, for gene therapy for the safety reasons. They are small viruses with a, a DNA of single strand, and they have the advantage of being transducing, dividing, and non-dividing cells. And uh, more importantly for gene therapy is that they have a, a long-term expression. Also, it has been characterized many serotypes, which one with a, a different tropism for a different tissue, which makes really um, many possibilities to select one of these uh, depending on the application. And also when we talk on recombinant vectors, uh, to produce them, uh, there are technologies to produce them at, at good titers, I would say high titers, but still there are some limitations. Uh, for instance, they are small viruses, so the cloning capacity is quite small. But altogether makes that is a very attractive and very used vector for, for gene therapy. Um, to understand uh, a little bit more what I will talk later on the insect cell, this is kind of a reminder, but it's important uh, to understand how it's organized, the vector, the virus itself, and the genome, and how it's the proteins which are expressed. So we know that the AAV, and particularly the AV2, is the most uh, characterized uh, vector and, and the genome. So we do have a, a, a sequences uh, on the left and the right sides, which are the inverted terminal repeats, the ITRs. And then we have two genes, the rep gene and the cap gene. The rep gene is responsible for all the proteins for the replication of the genome. And then we have the cap gene, which is responsible for producing the, the proteins for the capsid of the, of the vector. Uh, and then, which is important, is how it is controlled. In the, in the world type system, we do have uh, two promoters, P5 and P19, who express the rep proteins. And indeed, we have large rep proteins, 78-68, which are uh, one uh, is the splicing form of the other, and it's the same for the small reps, 52 and 40. One is a splicing form for the other. Uh, but they are expressed from two different promoters. In the case of the capsid proteins, they are expressed from the P40 promoter, and then is a very interesting mechanism because there is a specific stoichiometry for the three proteins, VP1, VP2, and VP3, and in AV vectors, essentially, it's, uh, it's known to be around 1, 1, and 10 this uh, stoichiometry being VP3, the majoritary protein. So then in the system, we have uh, uh, VP1 is, uh, is expressed from an, uh, a strong starting codon, then we have a, a less strong codon, ACG, and then we have again the, the ATG codon for VP3. Uh, later, in, it was about 2010, it was discovered that even in this genome, there are other proteins which are also expressed, in addition to the rep and the cap, that was the original ones described, and one is the AAP protein, which is the assembly activating protein, which is encoded inside the sequence of the capsid protein. But of course, it has a different uh, ORF, a different open reading frame, but it is inside the same sequencing. And I remind all of this because this will be uh, an important for, for all my talk and how we understand this is the world type virus in the mammalian system, and we will have to see how we have to adapt this system for the insect cells. As I said, uh, AAV vectors are, are well used and more and more used in the gene therapy for many diseases. It has been shown to be very effective in animal models, and then it has been translated to a good results in human trials. For instance, a liver trial for hemophilia, for the eye trials, and also for, for metabolic diseases. But in some cases, and particularly in those which uh, systemic applications are needed, uh, there are therapeutic benefits, but we need really high doses of vectors. So when I mean high doses, usually, like the hemophilia trials, we need more than 10 to the 14 vector genome per patient. So having this amount of vectors, it has two immediate consequences, which is a safety issue, making a huge load of particles, and also a practical issue, and also even economical issue, of course, is the manufacturing of these amounts of vectors. And here, I try to make some examples of what I mean to put these numbers in perspective. When we have examples of an eye trial, and you inject only one eye in the retina. Uh, in this uh, specific trial, they use uh, 111 vectors. So one patient is 111 vectors. So imagine you can do 100 patients with 10 to the 13 vectors. So for those who produce vectors, you know, this sounds reasonable. When we go to an application in the 
for instance, in the nervous system, but they have different injection sites, then we can maybe increase a little bit. But still, we have one patient in the round of 7, 8, 11. So again, we are still in numbers that to us it starts still being reasonable. However, when we move to a systemic application, which is the case for these trials of hemophilia, in the, in the doses, here is doses per kilo, so about 2 times 10 to the 12 vector genome per kilo. It means that a, a mean patient is about 10 to the 14 vectors. So immediately, if you think of having 100 patients, it makes you 10 to the 16 vector genomes. And this, for the people who start producing vectors, became uncomfortable. Uh, and then if you move to the, actually, for, for these diseases are, are really systemic, and, uh, and many muscles are affected, like the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This, these are preclinical data from our laboratory showing in animal models that to get efficacy, you need such a high doses, uh, more than 10 to the 13 vector genomes per kilo, which means one log higher. One patient is 10 to the 15. So again, the, in this example, 100 patients makes 10 to the 17 vectors. So these are really, uh, you will see the numbers. Uh, we will talk about numbers later, but it's really scary. <laughs> Uh, for those who use the vectors, usually and the most classical system to produce AAV vectors in the laboratory is using the transfection system. It's a very old method, but well-known method at the same time, uh, which uses the 293 cells that express the E1 gene. And then these cells are co-transfected with a plasmid which encodes for the rep and cap proteins and the adenovirus helper functions. This can be combined in one single plasmid or two, it's not an issue. And then you have your, your transgene of interest in the other side. So then you put all together in the cells. And because this is a mammalian virus, uh, it knows how to make the viruses and then you get the viruses. And this, in a, in a laboratory setting, usually, uh, historically, these 293 cells are grown in adherent cells, surface. So to make a more vectors and more vectors, because uh, everybody wants more vectors and more vectors. So you try to do um, a scale up systems, like using a roller bottle system, in which the cells are in adherent but ro uh, all around the bottle. But also, you can use a cell stack systems, in which you have several layers of cells. But for instance, I'm showing here some, I would say, roughly examples that for one roller bottle, you can get 10 to the 12 vectors, or in one CF10, which is 10 layers, you can get around 10 to the 13. But in perspective, and this is uh, from, um, from a review, uh, when they see how, how you move on this uh, scale of production. So I was telling before that when we are still talking about 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, it is something that when you are working in, in surface, in adherent, in adherent cells, uh, if we make the example of cells, cell stack factor and cell factories of 10 layers, you can produce 10 to the 14 essentially in 10 cell factories. More or less. Of course, this will depend on the vector serotype and so on. But if we start moving uh, in a way of logarithmic scale, of course, you may understand that if you have to do 100 cell uh, factories, you, need, you can usually do 20 uh, cell factories per run. So you will need five weeks of transfection. And if you need more, you will need 50 weeks of transfection and so on. So this is clearly that at a certain level, and very clear is around this level, is not feasible to, to continue to work on adherent cells and, and using the classical system. So there are a number of ideas and a number of possibilities uh, to try to, to move forward this in terms of production. And one of the systems that was actually described for the first time in 2002 by the team of uh, Rob Cotin in the NIH was on the idea of using insect cells, uh, for instance, the SF9 cells, uh, and in this case, why insect cells? Because insect cells are very robust cells. They can grow very easily. They can grow uh, in suspension very easily. And they have also a, a very um, they, a replication cycle very quick. I mean, the, the doubling time is uh, 24 hours. And so are m very convenient for, for manufacturing. It has been used in many other uh, systems, like protein. Mm, when you have to do recombinant proteins or even um, vaccines. And then the issue that Rob did in 2002 was to create a, the system of making AAV in these insect cells. And this is uh, the main topic that I will talk. And in the first uh, original idea was to use one vaculovirus, which was expressing the red proteins, a second vaculovirus with the cap protein, and a third vaculovirus with the transgene, as the, the one on the plasmid. Later on, in 2009, uh, they combined this rep and cap into the same vaculovirus. So you can work only with two. Vaculovirus, one that with the transgene and the other one with the rep and the cap of interest. 
And the advantage of this system is that the vaculovirus, they are viruses, so they will infect the cells. So you don't have limitations uh, as the one when you have to transfect the cells, which is a different, you need chemical compounds to transfect the cells. The fact that they are virus which infect naturally the cells, it makes it easy to, to, to transfer all of this uh, RepCap and transgene into the cells. What is the vaculovirus? The vaculovirus is a, is a virus from insect cells. <coughs> and uh, the one that is most used for all those, these uh, recombinant viruses are derived on the uh, Autographa californica, so this virus. And this is about 150 kV. So it's a huge, uh, relatively big uh, genome, which, uh, which is a double strand uh, uh, genome. Uh, and then how it is organized in the virus is quite interesting also, the cycle, because <coughs> there are two forms of virus. You have the single form, you have only one virus, which is called the baded virus, and you have a capsid, and then you have the envelope. So you have both capsid and envelope. And then when this, uh, this vector to create a resistance form, then they are aggregated, and they produce a protein, which is the polyhedrin protein, and then they are embedded in a, in, a, in a structure, which is very resistant. So you have all the capsids inside protected by this capsid of polyhedrin. And this is a kind of a resistance form that exists in the nature. So then when you have the insect here, and in nature, they will eat these uh, particles, uh, the virus, which are protected, and then goes to the intestine, and then you release the virus, and then it comes this form, which is the replicative form. And this is the form that we will use in recombinant uh, strategies because it's the one that replicates and, and it's growing in, in the cells and it's um, a single particle, I would say. What are the advantages of using the vaculovirus and the insect cells? <coughs> so, as I said, uh, they are very easy to grow the cells in suspension and also in terms of manufacturing is very critical that there are uh, media which are serum free, animal free, which is very convenient when you have to produce for GMP uh, manufacturing, the, not using animal uh, materials. Then it, the, the vaculovirus promoters are very, very active and very strong in the insect cells, of course. So you can have a, a good production of foreign proteins. Um, and also, they are non-pathogenic viruses, and in addition, they are non-vertebrate viruses. So they are also, in terms of safety, seems to be a safe, uh, quite safe virus compared to other systems which are using herpes simplex virus, for instance, for making AAV, then the safety issue is not the same. So there are a, a series of advantages that, that, that can say that this is a good system. And indeed, uh, Rob Cotin, when he demonstrated uh, this system, he also demonstrated the scale-up up to the 200 liter uh, bioreactors. And in this paper, he shows some example of vectors that using 200 liters bioreactors, then you can get up numbers in the range of 10 to the 16. So, so these are um, one of the, the, the major reasons why the system became popular because of Rob and uh, also this, this paper. But, <coughs> and we, this is the topic that today, and I, I will try to, to show what we are doing, is that the fact that the, that the system works, and this is clear, However, there are not much knowledge how it works, and this is where uh, I will talk today. Because uh, here I compare the original system in the mammalian, in mammalian cells, how it is controlled, and if we compare this of the, into the insect cells, what happened? To make the vectors in insect cells, we have to modify completely the biology. So the first thing, because the, the promoters are not the same, so we have to change the promoters, I will focus here on which is the dual system. So you have one uh, promoter which will express uh, the red proteins and one promoter which will express the, the capsid proteins. These promoters are either polyhedrin or P10, so are strong vaculovirus promoters. But then what happened to, there are no splicing, the, the splicing sites which are in the genes of AAV are non-recognized on the, on the insect cells. So there are no splicing. Uh, so when you do not have a splicing, what happened immediately, you will not get Rep68 and you will not get Rep40, but of course you will not get neither VP2 and VP3. So this has to be solved. You need all these proteins. For the Rep, it seems it's not critical. You can produce vectors only with Rep68 uh, and 52, and this is the case. So the strategy is to produce only the two Reps, one large and one small, but you are missing anyway two Reps. Uh, in the other hand, for the uh, capsid expression, then you have a promoter, but then uh, since you cannot rely on the splicing, there was a different strategy. It was the fact that using 
a, 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 a non-strong uh, codon, instead of having ATG, you have a mutation and you do an ACG, and then you have two times ACG, so for VP1, for VP2, and then you have an ATG for the VP3. What happens, so then, when you will have a translation of this, of this RNA, you will have a, what's called the ribosomal scanning leaky mechanism, so the ribosomal will read some of this of this uh, RNA, I will generate some VP1, but will continue, will read some of this uh, ACG and then will produce some VP2, and then and then will go through the uh, ATG and then you will have most of the protein will be VP3. But this is a little bit of theoretical and empiric, uh, it works, but it's not as the same control as the, as the mammalian cells. So this kind of uh, biology, as you have seen, is uh, not perfect and is not the regular biology of the vector. And there are other issues that are not known in insect cells, and for instance, we have here the example, the AAP protein that was discovered in 2010 is not known how it works in the insect cells. Um, so here I, I summarize uh, what, what we do for producing the, the AAP in the insect cells. <coughs> As I told you, we generate one construct with the transgene, we gener generate a second one with the rep and the cap, so you generate, first you have to generate the recombinant viruses. So first, of course, there are some molecular biology to generate the bug meats. Then in the cells, you generate the recombinant viruses. And then when you have the, the, the viruses, you infect the cells, and then you generate the particles. Uh, still, the particles are not perfect. This is true for baculovirus, but this is true for other systems. You do have your transgene of interest, but you have also empty capsids. This is true in, in all of the systems. But there are also particles which encapsidate illegitimate DNA, and this will be one of the subjects of the talk. And this happens in any system. So the point is how much and which kind of DNA encapsulation do you have and which are the consequences. So today I will ex talk about two subjects that we are working on this, uh, on this topic, on the AAV in insect cells. One will be the role of the assembly activating protein. For the first time we have characterized it in insect cells. And the second topic will be the characterization of the DNA contaminants in the stocks of AAV and comparing the insect cells and the mammalian system. So for the first case was to really uh, look carefully what's happened with the AAP protein in the insect cells. <coughs> Here it was described for the first time in 2010 by the Kleinschmidt group in Germany. So this AAP protein is a relatively small protein and it is, as I said before, is a second ORF in the same uh, gene of, of, the, of the capsid. Okay. Uh, there are uh, the, 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 the sequence, and here we have some, some um, uh, comparison between the different serotypes. It seems that all AAP of the different serotypes have some common uh, structures, and particularly you have uh, clearly the nuclear uh, localization signal and the nucleotide localization signal, and this is important because AAP seems to work as a way of, of, uh, of encapsulation happens in the nuclei of the cells, and particularly in the nucleolus. So AAP seems to have a role for, for the encapsulation into the nuclei of, of the cells. There are many things which are not um, clear how this uh, works and how this interacts with the VP proteins, whether this interact with the VP and then move to the nuclei, or uh, VP goes to the nuclei and then AAP goes to the nuclei and then they interact. But anyway, they have to interact to do the assembly of the different VP. Uh, today, and there are more and more work and teams working on, on AAP, there are particularly Luke Vandenberg and the team of Hirona Kai and Dirk Grimm, and that the work that I will present is in collaboration with Dirk Grimm. And uh, the information that people is, uh, is, is, is showing is that it seems that there are serotypes which are completely dependent on AAP. So if you do not have AAP, you mutate AAP, you do not get any vector, any assembled vector. I'm talking about assembly, not about genomes. So if you do not have AAP, you do not have assembly of the capsids. However, there are also, in the opposite case, it seems that some serotypes, and this was shown by, by Nakai in the ICGT, for instance, AV5, you can knock down the AAP for AV5, and then you get AV5 vectors, which are completely functional. So th there are some really dependent and some completely independent, and then I probably think that there are something that are partially dependent. So the fact which means partially dependent, it means that if you have it, you have the real maximum effect. If you don't have it, it can work, but not at the optimal level. So what, what we did, actually, is um, uh, trying to investigate in the, in, the, in, the mammal, in the insect cells and in the, in the expression cassettes that I was explaining to you before, to investigate the role of AAP. 
and this was in collaboration with Dirk Green because Dirk already did this m same mutation in the AV2 for the mammalian cells and he shown that it is completely dependent, the, s the system in the AV2. So uh, this PhD student in, in my lab, he did this experiment, exactly the same mutation which is affecting the, st the, the start codon of AAP and then introducing a stop codon. So to be sure that AAP is completely uh, knocked down, but also, and more importantly, you have to do this in ways of which are silent mutations for the VPs. Because <laughs> if you mutate the AP, remember that it is in the VP capsid, so you will mutate the VP capsid. So you have to do mutations that <coughs> do not change the amino acid sequence of the VPs. So this this was done, and then here we have a, we, we check first we generate the vaculovirus first. So as I said, we have a vaculovirus with the rep and cap, and then we we check for the expression of of, of the AAP. It was an antibody developed by, by Dirk. And then we have one cells which are uh, insect cells non-infected with vaculoviruses, cells which are infected with the vaculoviruses. Here, GP39 is the glycoprotein of the, of the particle, just to show that these cells are actually infected. And then we have particles insect infected with the world type rep 2 cap 2 which is the case of uh, in this line. So we have AAP. And then we have the same, but with the mutation in, in, the, caps in the AAP, and then we do not have the AAP. So first was to verify that really it was a completely knocked down. And then when we have the vaculovirus uh, here, uh, mutated or non-mutated, in the AAP then we can produce vectors. So <coughs> we, we add <coughs> the one with the transgene. For practical reasons, we, we use a GFP transgene. Then you infect the cells uh, with the two vectors. Then you do a harvest, do a cell ly lysis, and then you do a, a, a clarid uh, uh, lysate. So we are investigated first before purification, just in the, in the lysate, what has been uh, really assembled or not assembled. So here we have quantified uh, in different transgenes, we have used GFP but also other transgenes, and produce using either the vaculovirus with the wall type AAP2 or with the mutant AAP2. So first we check for the production of vector genomes. So in, in general terms, this is what we get usually, about 2 times 10 to the 10 vector genome per milliliter, so about uh, the same 10 to the 13 per, per liter. And, uh, but this is vector genomes. And then we measure also in these lysates by uh, ELISA method, which is a specific ELISA which recognizes the assembled capsids. You know, the A20 antibody recognizes only assembled part particles and not only free VPs. So here what you are measuring actually is really fully composed and fully assembled particles. So as expected, we do have uh, particles and we do have vector genomes in the normal situation. However, when we do the mutant, when we check the vector genomes, we can immediately see a, a dramatic uh, drop, more than two logs. Uh, I have to say that it's very difficult to get zero in this case because for the vaculoviruses, they have the genome inside the vaculoviruses. So when you have always contaminants of, uh, at this level, they are non-purified. So you always have contaminants of DNA from the vaculoviruses. So this is the level of, we know that this is the level of vaculovirus contamination. So this is not real um, AAV genomes. Uh, that's where you see the two log difference. But more importantly is when you look for the assembly of the particles, you do not have any assembly of the particles. So this is a clear demonstration that really AAP is uh, absolutely needed in the insect cells for having uh, a, a fully assembled particles. And uh, more importantly, when you try, it, this is in the, in the lysate, if you try to purify the vectors and you go through the cesium gradient, uh, for instance, you don't get any particle at all during the purification. So then we did this, the, the following experiments. Okay, we know we can do the knockdown, and then you do not have AAP, so then you, you do not generate the particles. Can we transcomplement? Can we give back the AAP in a different vaculovirus and rescue the phenotype? So this is what we generate a transcomplementary approach. So we have the world type or the mutant uh, vaculovirus, and then we use a, a, a strategy in which we incorporate an external cassette to the transgene with, a, a, again, a P10 promoter and the wall type AAP. So in this case, this is the two examples that I show you, the wall type or the mutant. Now we can do the same thing. We can do, in a mutant, we transcomplement, but we can do also that in a wall type case, we can also use this cassette to overexpress. So we can do either a transcomplementation of the mutant or we can do an overexpression of the AAP and see whether an AAP or overexpression may have a benefit or not. So here are the results. As I show you, this is vector genomes. 
When you have the wall type and you have the mutant, you have a drop, a two lock uh, drop of the vector genomes, as I show. What happens when you do the transcomplementation? You rescue the production of the vector. So it's good, the fact that you can transcomplement them in a different vector. You don't need to be in the same cis uh, element. Uh, and also, we test the overexpression, but it seems to be clear that overexpressing do not have an advantage. Uh, very likely because already in the in uh, are uh, overexpressed already the, the AAP in the system. So these are important for, for production issues. But for the mechanism issues, how it works the AAP. So the AAP actually we wanted to to investigate more and we started to investigate the, the time course expression and, and, and the mechanism. And here we have a western blot for the VPs and a, a western blot for the AAP. And then we have the mu the world type or the mutant. Uh, if you look at the first time point, 24 hours, well, for the world type, we, we do have AAP as expected, and in the mutant, we do not have the AAP as expected. Next, at 48 hours, the world type, we still have the AAP, and again, in the mutant, we do not have the AAP. But interesting, at 72 hours, in the world type, we have the proteins of the VP, for sure, but AAP disappears. So really, it's timely regulated. And it is regulated completely at the protein level because, of course, you know it's in the same in the, in the same frame. So there is clearly a, a close talk, and there is a timely regulation of the protein, completely independent one to the other. But actually, they are dependent one of the other because AAP. When w you do not have AAP, and this is the case of the mutant, you can see always in in these situations, 48 hours, 72 hours, and 96 hours, VP are non-stabilized and are degraded in the absence of the AAP protein. So clearly, the AAP is working as, 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 as to stabilize the VP proteins. And indeed, in only in the case where, where we do have the knockdown, we can see uh, bands which looks like uh, ubiquitinization and degradation of the VP when there is uh, actually um, uh, a loss of the AAP function. So really, there is a, a role, uh, active role for the encapsidation, but there is a secondary role, and, uh, which is really um, a role of chaperone, I would say, to stabilize the, the AAB. So in conclusion, and in, in, the, in the baculovirus, what we de determine is that the AAP is really required for the assembly as equal to the mammalian cells. Um, unfortunately, because I think my first idea was if it's not ne needed for the baculo, it would be an advantage compared to, other, to the other systems. But actually, it seems that it's actually needed the way of the mammalian cells. Uh, we show that also AAP stabilizes the VP proteins. And which is incredibly, I think, very curious is how it's transiently expressed and, and uh, cross-talked and regulated through the VPs in a normal situation. Uh, also, we test the expression, but it doesn't seem to be a, a, an, an advantage for the yields. But what is important is the transcomplementary strategy that it's, it works, as I show you. It could be useful in those strategies where the people are doing mutations of the capsid, like shuffling or ancestral reconstruction and other uh, manipulations of the capsids that um, not uh, on purpose, but you can mutate the AAP sequence and then you can generate non-functional AAP sequencing. Uh, if you do cycles of production, of course, you will select only those who, who grow and then AAP will be co-selected. But however, there are strategies, for instance, like um, Luke Vandenberg did for the ancestral reconstruction in which he did the generation of novel capsids without taking into account the AAP. So in all of his cases, he put AAP in trans, so to forget the AAP. So in such a scenario, if AAP is needed, you will need to complement in trans, and we know that this is feasible also in the baculovirus for the same reason. So this is the first um, history that we wanted to, to, to see uh, in the insect cells. And the, and the second story that I, that I was really interested in is in the DNA encapsidation uh, of this vaculovirus uh, genes and this vaculovirus DNA into the AV particles. Because uh, as um, if you have been in the field, uh, when there were the clinical trials uh, for uh, this disease, for the lipoprotein lipase, uh, it was done by Unicure. Uh, these vectors uh, <coughs> have get to the market, so they are commercialized, and these were produced with the vaculovirus system. But through the, actually through the development of the, of the product, it was very criticized uh, the amount of vaculovirus uh, DNA that were in the, in the stocks. So they, have, they did a, long, a lot of work on that. Uh, and it was a, a major criticism from the EMA uh, during this approval. And more importantly, if, if we do have these contaminants, and again, if we are talking about high doses of particles, of course, we will be co-injecting this uh, DNA to the patients, uh, and it's a safety, a safety, a safety problem.
So then we get interested in, in going in deep into the encapsulation of this DNA into the particles. And the first study was first with the, with the mammalian cells, so with the system that is uh, well known. And uh, I will show you a new system to characterize this, this, uh, this contaminants. Here is, uh, as I said before, but in a different way. So we have in the, in the transfection system, we have the plasmids. But importantly, as you know, these plasmids, because they are plasmids, they have prokaryotic uh, sequences. And they also have adenovirus helper genes. Then you have the DNA from the cells. So all these DNAs, prokaryotic sequencing, adenovirus sequences, and, and uh, human DNA sequences, can be in the particles. Of course, viruses are purified to go to the clinic. That's for sure. You have to purify. And there are different methods for purification in, in GMP. You can use either gradients, uh, cesium chloride or eudixanol, and then you can separate the particles uh, from junk using this gradient, and then you pick the band. Uh, there are also the, the type more uh, industrial scale using columns. You can use columns either with immune affinity, then they have antibodies that uh, bind the, the capsid, or you can have uh, columns with different affinities for ion, anion exchange affinities, cationic or anionic, and then playing with the conditions. You can um, bind your AAV to the particles and then uh, separate from the impurities. So these are different methods which are perfectly used for the, for, for, the, for the GMP manufacturing. But still, and here I'm a little bit provocative, I still think that there are many contaminants that are still in the preparation. We are sure that we have our vectors, but we may have uh, also proteins. We are sure there are proteins which are non-AAV. Uh, uh, we are sure that there are so, so some chemicals because we put them for purification like PEC or like uh, Triton, like many others. Uh, we should have lipids from the membranes. So all of this, uh, of course, when you look your gel or a, micropos a microscope is not so looking like that. But somehow these contaminants are there, uh, more or less. And I think it's important to keep in mind. Uh, now I will focus only on the DNA contaminants. Uh, because it has been already characterized, it's not completely new. There are in, in the field, it has been characterized which are the DNA contaminants in AAV stocks. Uh, thanks to God, I would say that more than 80% usually is the vector genome, is what we want. But still, uh, in depend depending on the manufacturing uh, uh, method and depending on the uh, expression cassette and, and many other parameters, you have significant and very significant amounts of antibiotic resistant genes. And uh, this is true uh, in all cases. And this is why, uh, why for GMP manufacturing, uh, usually the plasmids that are used are not the ampicillin plasmids, are usually used canamycin plasmids because there are less resistance in humans. So because we know there are contaminants, you can change ampicillin for canamycin, but still you have canamycin for sure. And then you can have other sequences from, from, the, from the adenovirus, for instance, for the genomic DNA, but also uh, not the safety uh, perspective, but for an uh, efficacy perspective, you can have genomes which are truncated genomes, and this can interfere with your, with your uh, complete genome. So all of this is interesting to characterize what you have in your preparation, either from a, I would say, um, legal regulatory perspective, but also at an efficacy perspective. And more importantly, the, the, the safety of this uh, we have shown in our laboratory uh, many years ago that actually these contaminants that are in the preps are transferred in vivo. So when you analyze, the canam for instance, canamycin sequences in the prep, you do have, but when you inject vectors in an animal and you check for the canamycin in the tissues of the animals, you do have these sequences in the animal and they persist uh, several years. So it's important to characterize these contaminants, the quality and the type of the contaminants. And as I said, this can also play a role uh, interacting with the, the therapeutic potential. Uh, the most used technique, uh, as everybody do, is using a, classically a qPCR. So you do a PCR because, to look for these DNA pieces because you know that you have uh, genomes, you know you have a prokaryotic sequence, you know you have adenovirus sequence and so on. So you design your PCR against these target sequences. And this is quite uh, quick and cheap today. Making a real-time PCR is very quick and cheap, I would say. However, you need a specific PCR for each target that you want to, to, to choose. And also, uh, it's not written here, but you will only look, uh, I mean, you will only find what you are looking for. If you don't do the PCR for something, you will never detect it, of course. So the idea in the laboratory, and this was the work by Adrian Leisure before, was trying to use the next generation sequencing technologies, and particularly the Illumina sequencing, 
to characterize these DNA contaminants. The advantage is clear. Uh, there is no target specific. It's a complete uh, picture of what do you have. And then you can also use, uh, and I will explain you how, you can use the, the reads, the Illumina reads, as a way of doing a percentage of quantifications. But in addition of the percentage, do you have a real-time information on the sequence for your DNA, which is also important because it's also an identity uh, test that you do in your preparations. However, up to date yet, they are a little bit time-consuming and, of course, expensive. But uh, the more and more it advances, it will make less expensive, I would say. However, we have the first issue that we have for the AAV is that we have a single-stranded virus. It's not a double-stranded virus. And Illumina sequencing, if you are used to it, uh, is a double-strand uh, technique. You need to have a, a double-strand vector. <coughs> so this is, was the work, as I said, from Adrian Lega, and it was published uh, last year uh, in, uh, in Nantes. Uh, it's a strategy to characterize different preparations. In that case, it was an AV8 try to produce in different, in different methods to see whether the method of purification play a role. And also, <coughs> you know that in AAV you can have DNAs which are encapsulated into the particles or outside of the particles. So usually people do kind of DNA treatments to remove DNA which is not encapsulated into the particle and trying to characterize with this encapsulated versus non-encapsulated. So the first step was in using different preparations was to extract the DNA, which is a single strand vector, as I said. So the first step is to make the second strand using random examiners. And then it was, uh, uh, you have to couple, you have to break the DNAs and then you have to, to, to use your Illumina adapters and then you do the PCR and then you do the sequencing. Uh, what you have actually is uh, about uh, uh, 200 base pair reads. So the reads are quite small at the end of the day. But <coughs> here is how it works. The, we have a barcode for, for each of these, uh, of these reads to identify. And then by bioinformatics, you have your reference sequences. For uh, instance, you have your genome. And then you have uh, bioinformatics to align all your reads to your genome. And then uh, these uh, are uh, different reads. And then what you can obtain with this is, of course, uh, the, the, the sequence information because all of these reads will verify if your sequence is correct or not, uh, identification. But the idea here is to use this number of reads to make you a percentage, a quantification, because you know, the more DNA you have, the more reads you will have of this particular DNA. And this is the true also for the genome, but also for the other contaminants. So you have to generate libraries as a control, and then you compare the reads that you obtain for, for, for your genome compared to the other contaminants. So then you get two types of information. You get quantitative analysis, as I said, the percentage of reads which match here compared to the number of re reads that match to the contaminants. And then you have a second information, which is the coverage. For instance, if you have a, a, a significant deletion uh, in, in your transgene, you will have a, a, a hole in, in, in the reads. So it, it can give you information on the coverage of your sequences. Here I'm showing an example of, of this quantification using next generation sequencing. This is one preparation, but in the paper you can find all the preparations that were done. But it was uh, first data, it was very interesting because I, I think I put together. If you compare the classical uh, PCR data with the next generation sequencing data, the first surprise that was really quite mm, correlation. So uh, as I said, more than 90% are the, 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 the vector genome. And the plasmid, in this case the vector plasmid, it accounts between 2% uh, measured by qPCR, 5% measured by, by, by NGS sequencing. Also, uh, the helper plasmid is, a comp is a much, much less, and the genome of the cells are really minimal. And as you can see, one of the differences is that here with NGS, you can quantify even very small amount of DNA you can quantify by, C by Illumina that you cannot do by PCR because at a certain point there is a limit of quantification. But more importantly, and this is what you were actually looking for, uh, as I said, and you only put the percentage. This you can do it essentially with the PCR, and you would say, why you need to do that if you do that it's simple and that's the same information but they are not exactly the same because one of the things with the NGS data that Adrian did was to uh, look for uh, the, the human DNA you know you have uh, the contaminant human DNA in the preparations and then he looked for uh, the number of reads that are in a different chromosome 
to see, first thing is either all chromosomes of the, of the producer cell line, the 293, are equally represented into the DNA of the AAV particles. And actually he found that essentially they are equally represented. So it means that the encapsulation of the human uh, cell line, from the producer cell line to the AAV, seems to be a random. Uh, so this is a very important information because when you do a QPCR, you only take one gene of the whole uh, genome. So if there are regions which are more uh, preferentially encapsulated than other regions, you may have a bias on this QPCR quantification. So here was not the case with NGS. It was shown that you have an equal representation of all uh, chromosomes. But more importantly, they were uh, using this technique to say, wow, this preparation, it has much more of, this, uh, of the reads in this specific gene. Why? There is no reason why. And then looking for, it was a specific AAV preparation that was purified in a column that were another vector purified. And then the vector, you know, have a, your cDNA of interest is a, was a human cDNA. And then you say, well, all these reads were matching to a cDNA, human cDNA, but was not the chromosome, was the vector that was previously purified. So actually, it was a contaminant, not expected contaminant on the preparation. So imagine that when you produce many thousands of vectors, you may have cross-contaminations. So having this kind of information, you can see whether your preps have been, uh, do have contamination from other preps. So this is, for instance, one application that was not expected for that. Or also, another unexpected finding was that only in the preparations done by cesium chloride, by, by gradients, there were found some um, mitochondrial DNA. That it seems that in the centrifugation process, there are some mitochondria that can go also to the AAV because they are quite similar in size. And in these preparations, probably have a little bit more contaminant of mitochondrial. And then when you measure DNA, you have mitochondrial DNA. So these are a couple of examples that you can find things that you were not looking for, and this is very powerful, I would say. The second information I said is that you can have uh, the, the coverage of your, of your transgene. Um, and here you can see that this kind of homogeneous, but not completely, you, you can see that there are some specific areas which are underrepresented or, or overrepresented. And this is important because uh, for any reasons, this is probably due to the sequencing uh, technology itself of the PCR technology itself, but there are areas that, which could be eventually more difficult to amplify as here as here. Because here, there is not only the vectors, but there is also a normalizer, a, a DNA normalizer. So this is not an, a, an issue which is related to the vector. This is an issue which is related to the sequencing or the PCR techniques. So you can imagine if you are using this area for PCR of your vector, you may have a, a, a different result than having a PCR on that, on that area, for instance. And also another application that did Adrian was in a pool of vectors that you have 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, you may, every vector may have a different sequence. If there are uh, variants, uh, uh, for instance, single nu nu nucleotide variants uh, in all your thousand of genomes, you may have uh, a different uh, um, positions in a, in, along the transgene. So he checked all the reads, whether they have the same position or not. So the variability of each of the positions. And for instance, you can find that some spots are more prone to have mutations. And if one spot, you have 15% of your genomes that have uh, this mutation, particular mutation in this site. And if this mutation is actually truncated in your transgene, it means that 50% of your transgenes will not be effective. So this has also an important application for, for, for the efficacy of the data. And also, uh, a second information that he got is looking carefully uh, when you have the plasmid and your, and your recovery from ITR to uh, the ITR, actually looking uh, carefully that you have reads that are between the ITR and the plasmid. So it's not completely um, like you may imagine in an in silico model that there is a decrease. Uh, you have really a, a sharp decrease, so really uh, the ITR uh, is making the role, I would say. There are more copies in the transgene than in the backbone, but still you have backbone which is encapsulated through the ITR. Uh, so really there are uh, some pieces of DNA which are uh, including uh, ITR and uh, plasmid backbone. Then um, I will go short, uh, I will explain a little bit short, because this was done only with one vector. And I was really interested to see this contamination, how it plays a role when you have a different transgene and different size of the transgene. It has been shown, or at least uh, some suggestion, that depending on the size of your transgene can play a role on the DNA encapsulation of the contaminant DNA encapsulation. So we did this experiment with the NGA sequencing using four different uh, transgenes, and then we quantify. And it was quite surprising that um, you have here the, 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 the cassette, so 2.2, 3.2, 3.5, 4.5, uh, 
And then we have the percentage of incantation. Uh, the, the genome is always minimal, and the helper plasmid the same. Uh, AAV is, maj is majority. But it was quite interesting to, because when the hypothesis, uh, and most of the people think that when you have a short genome, you give more space for uh, contaminant DNA to fit into the AAV. So this seems to be the model. You have 5% of vector plasmid. When you have a larger cassette, it seems that you have less. And this seems to be the rule in blue. But in this case, you have a 3.2 cassette. We have extremely low. So it could be that the majority case is that one. But also, there are some things that is not completely dependent on the size. And there are, could be other explanations for encapsulation of these DNA contaminants. And this is only an observation. This is not an experimental data. It's just an observation. Uh, for this, for this uh, set of data that I have shown you, if you look also at the backbone size, the backbone size is also an important issue. Because as I said, the backbone is also encapsulated. So in this uh, small cassette, you have a small cassette and a small backbone. So you have everything favor to encapsulate illegitimate DNA. In this case, you have a 4.5 uh, transgene and 4.3 backbone. And in this case, you have a 3.2 cassette, but 4.7 backbone. So maybe the fact that having a larger backbone, you reduce the encapsulation of the backdoor uh, plasmid. This could be one issue that has been already pointed out by other teams. But also, and I don't know whether it's relevant or not, but I think it is, is the thermostability of the DNA molecule itself. So the, the thermostability of the DNA molecule, which depends on the composition of the, of the, of the nucleotides of, the, of your genome, this makes a different thermostability. And maybe the fact that these molecules have a, a, a lower thermostability were easily encapsulated, and then you reduce uh, the encapsulation of, of, of the DNA contaminants. But these are only suggestions that could explain this, uh, this, uh, these differences. But as I said, this is not really experimentally checked. Um, <coughs> I will skip because it's the same. So if you have contaminants uh, of DNA contaminants in the transfection system, one of the solutions that has been uh, proposed, and this is uh, recently published, is uh, one technology is to use, for instance, mini plasmid uh, DNA, mini circle DNA. In that case, uh, what, uh, what you do is you have your cassette, and then you have your backbone, but then there is a recombination here, and then you separate completely the backbone DNA, which contains the antibiotic and so on, and only your transgene here. And this has been done by, by Plasmid Factor in collaboration with Hitler Garbun in Germany. And indeed, they, they demonstrate that when you produce classically with the plasmid plasmid, you have uh, contaminant DNA. But when you use a mini, mini circle, mini circle, you remove significantly, uh, logarithmically, the amount of contaminants of DNA. So this is one of the solutions to remove contaminant DNA, at least from the plasmid, when you tra do transfection. So this is the backbone information for the transfection. But as I said, we are interested in the, in the insect cells. So in, in the insect cells, uh, I summarized before, we have the baculoviruses. Then we amplify the uh, in, 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 in bioreactors. And then we purify by column, by TFF, and so on. And then we do the characterization. In this particular experiment, we have used this model, so which is a, 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 a genome about 3.3 kV. And then we have to do it in two different serotypes to see whether the, the serotype plays a, a relevant role. And then we have purified also by different techniques, uh, gradients or ABB. First, uh, we use the qPCR, which are the classical one. But in this case, if you remember the baculovirus genome, what happens is that we incorporate our genomes, the ITR or the rep and cap, in a, in a, in a, in a specific site of the genome. But you, as you know, it's a huge genome. And then we, have, we design PCRs into the cassette, for instance, for ITR. We have uh, also a, a PCR, which is in the gentamicin, because this gentamicin is used for the selection of the baculoviruses, but it, it is outside of the ITR. But it is close to the ITRs, because it's used for the selection of the transgenes. And, but uh, the important information is that gentamicin is close to the ITR. And then we select a, a gene which is far from the ITRs, which is at the opposite side. For instance, the DNA is polymerized. And then we did all these quantifications. Uh, with or without DNAs. <clears throat> and then we, we, we get these numbers of quantification. Again, we have majority of the transgene, so ITR. But we can get uh, back is the, the sequence that is far from the ITR. And gentamicin is the one that which is close. So here, if you look the contaminants of one or the other, the contaminants of back is, looks to be much lower than the contaminants of the gentamicin. Uh, so that was the first, uh, first surprise. And this is true either in, uh, when you look with or without DNA. So it means really these sequences are really encapsulated into the AAV. So what is the, reali what is the reality 
we, if we have the percentage, if we have the percentage, and we know 3.3 is the genome, we know the baculovirus genome is 150. If we have a percentage uh, of uh, only by qPCR, uh, if we take the numbers of this value, sorry for that, if you take the numbers of bug and you do the percentage against to the ITRs, and then you get about 1 or 2 percent of contaminations. However, if you take the numbers of the gentamicin and you do the same calculation by percentage of copies, then you get 10 percent of encapsulation. So what is the real situation? Do you have 2 percent contaminants or do you have 10 percent contaminants? And this is the issue of the qPCR. Depending on where you select your qPCR, you cannot know. So that's what we were really interested in adapting what I have presented before for the mammalian to the insect cell. Uh, this was Magali again, because it needs a lot of adaptations for changing all the sequencing, all the preparation, all the step for second strand synthesis and so on. So it was all adapted to the, to the insect cell system using vaculovirus sequence as, um, uh, as reference sequences and the genome of the SF9, SF21. And then we did, we did quantifications. And then, uh, interestingly, when we do it by NGS, and this is NGS data, we observe that, again, AAV is the major, 99-98%. Uh, uh, we have minimal contaminations of the RepCAP sequences. And here we have the contamination of baculovirus DNA. And in this case, we have only about 1% of contaminants. So this is really much more true because here you are characterizing all uh, the complete genome of baculoviruses. So we are more uh, confident that the total contamination is around 1%. And this was the case, either encapsulated or non-encapsulated. And <clears throat> when I say encapsulated and not encapsulated, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mammalian system is very clear. But in the insect cells, people immediately will ask, yes, but you may have some vaculovirus particles which are outside, and because they have a capsid, you are measuring the DNA of the vaculovirus particles that are close to your uh, AAV particles. So to do that, we, we did a lot of tests to, to check that really, if you have free vaculovirus uh, DNA, which are the bag meat, they are removed by the DNA cocktail that we are using. And then also, and more importantly, we did some tests to show that actually if you have vaculoviruses, free vaculoviruses uh, particles in your stocks, you can remove them by different types of filtration, and then you can really reduce this DNA from external vaculoviruses particles. However, if you have your uh, genome, as I showed before, this vaculovirus sequence is not removed by the filters. It means that it is completely encapsulated into the particles. So we did a lot of tests to show that really the, when you have these uh, sequences of vaculovirus sequences are really in the particles and are not free uh, DNA particles, which are uh, DNA sequences either free or either in particles of vaculoviruses. So really I think that the data that we have in terms of percentage is really the data that the DNA encapsulated into the AV. And finally, uh, to finalize, and going to the, again, the, the, the coverage of the, of the sequences. Here is a little bit more much complex compared to the plasmid <coughs> because here I'm representing the whole genome of the vaculovirus genome, again, 150. At a certain <coughs> point in the middle, you have your uh, AAV cassette, okay? And then you have the, the coverage, uh, the number of reads of each of these sequences of, that you have in your AAV stocks. Majority, again, is in the AAV, as expected. But then uh, you have two log less, uh, which is vaculovirus DNA, okay, around the, and, but what is very interesting is that the far you are from the, uh, from the insert, from the ITRs, you see a decrease in the contaminant of the sequencing. And actually, if you look carefully, the, the regions which are very close to the ITRs, you have an over-representation of this encapsulation. And actually, this explains why if you do a PCR here of the gentamicin, is 10 times more if you do the PCR here of the, of the vaculovirus uh, DNA. So really, the encapsulation is not equal in along the vaculovirus genome, and particularly is high and very high, uh, close to the ITRs. If we do actually, uh, uh, in we look carefully, and uh, we do a zoom here of, of this area, we see this decrease from the ITRs. It goes decrease through uh, to the um, vaculovirus DNA, and actually, I don't know whether it is really relevant or, or not, but I think it is, is that if we have here the ITRs, and if we check the amount of DNA that are majoritarily encapsulated, it's about 4.7 uh, base pair. So what I think also is an indirect evidence, of course, but I think that the ITR is acting as a prime 
for encapsidation, of course less efficiently than the, than the, than the regular one, but also is acting as a prime for encapsidation of vaculovirus DNA. And actually we look carefully, but in the other sense, we have essentially the same. We have also a decrease in the, in the an increase close to the ITRs and a decrease later. And if we do this, here we have only 1.3, but remember that our cassette is 3.3. So I think that we have a read through of this ITR. So these are only potential explanations that in one case you can have a prime for the ITR, and in the other case you may have actually a read through the ITR and encapsulating uh, more than your, than your cassette. So I think these are the conclusion of the, of the second part is that the, um, actually next generation sequencing is very important because you can identify and you quantify the DNA species. Um, then the, we do have contaminants. Uh, this is a, the percentage. Transfection, uh, you can have 0 0.6, you can have 5, you can have 10. Uh, what we have measured in vaculovirus is around 1 and not more than 2%. So the first thing is that we do not have more DNA contaminant in vaculovirus particles than in the transfection. This is not uh, uh, an idea that people think uh, this is the case. It's not, it's not the case. Of course, it could depend on the vaculovirus system that you use to produce the, the, the particles. Uh, however, uh, this percentage, it is low, it is high, this will depend because depending on the doses that you are injecting, imagine that if you are injecting 10 to the 14 particles and you have 5%, so at the end of the day you are injecting 5 times 10 to the 12 contaminant particles per kilogram, which is uh, totally, absolutely huge. So which are the impacts? So it has to be seen. Uh, also, the, the fact that you have a complete uh, picture is that you have also ideas of whether you have a truncation which can avoid the, the efficacy of your transgene, and you can have mutations which affect the efficacy as well. And also very interesting in this, uh, uh, when we look carefully ar around the ITRs, is that we saw actually an increase in the capsidation of the baculovirus sequences close to the ITRs. That seems to be clear. And this is important because uh, in, in several vaculovirus systems, there are antibiotic resistant genes for the selection. So this antibiotic resistance will be preferentially encapsidated compared to the other sequences. And here more on the biology side, although it's preliminary, it seems that there is an ITR dependent mechanism, whatever it means, but really close to the ITRs, there are more encapsidation. So ITR is playing a role in this process, whatever, whatever mechanism it is. And also the idea is to use this technology to uh, have more knowledge about the encapsidation itself when you want to mutate red proteins, when you want to mutate uh, AAP proteins and so on, and you want to understand how it is really encapsidated, this is a great technology to, to, to look at. And just to end, uh, this is uh, Illumina sequencing, which has a major advantage. A major advantage is that it's very low rate of, of mutations when you do the sequencing, so really to verify the sequence is very powerful. Uh, however, you have short reads. So uh, when you have to, sequen to sequence, for instance, vaculovirus genomes and so on, you, you, with this small reads, you cannot sequence the, gen the complete genome because vaculovirus have uh, large homologous regions. So if you have 80, uh, 800K uh, base pair, which are homologous in different regions of the genome, by Illumina, you will never know which region is which. So actually, our idea is to combine with the new technologies, which is the, the PacBio sequencing, because in this case, the PacBio, it has information at a single molecule level. So then you can really single molecule uh, analysis of your vaculovirus stocks to understand whether you have a variability uh, and so on. But this technology is very powerful because you can have long reads up to uh, 20 kV. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's a technology that generates still a lot of uh, errors when do the sequencing. So about 10% of error of sequencing. So it's not a good technology for uh, identification of your genome. Uh, you should stay with the Sanger sequencing if you want to verify your sequence. The fact, but however, here you have one single molecule and uh, large uh, uh, pieces of DNA can be sequenced at the single molecule level. So I think the combination of the two techniques will be really uh, uh, the way to go for many of these applications. And here I thank all the people in the lab, you know, Philippe Moulier, and all the work particularly that I show from, from the, my student, Magali, and also the bioinformatics team, which are, as you have seen, bioinformatics is key for all these analysis. It was started by Adrian, and then <coughs> we do have Emily and, and Aurelian, who is doing most of the bioinformatics and then on the production of vectors. We do have also a lot of um, uh, help from the, from, the, from the platform 
uh, of uh, sequencing and, and bioinformatics, Pierre and Risha, and we did some collaboration for the vectors with the with Geneton team. Thank you for your attention.